Okay, this is our last lecture on uh, floor what a true soil. And we're going to practice a number of things. So this is flow of water through soils. And we're going to uh, do a lot of uh, problems together. Uh, we're going to do problems on uh, drawing a flow net, uh, on calculating heads of water, calculating uh, hydraulic gradients, calculating uh, water pressure, uh, uplift force, seepage force, um, quick condition. We're going to do all this in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So the first thing is, so I'm on page uh, 396. And I'm looking at uh, the figures there, figure 13.3. And we're going to do a few, a few flow nets. We're going to start with the dam. And I'm going to try to, uh, to do it to approximately to scale. So we have a dam. The dam is not very high. It's only uh, 17 meters high or 18 meters high. We'll put it right here. So I have a dam. And the dam is like this. We have water on this side. And we have a little bit of water on the other side. Okay? And we have a tow drain to make sure that the uh, make sure that the water stays within the dam and exits through the tow drain here. So this is large particles so that it drains easily. So that's going to force the water to come into this drain rather than exiting on the downstream phase, which is, uh, 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 is to be avoided uh, by design. Uh, the dam has, so this is impervious. So the water cannot go underneath the dam in this case. So the water is limited to going through the dam. And we're going <coughs> to draw the flow net. So first of all, this is, remember we say we first draw boundary flow lines. So boundary flow lines, certainly uh, this is one of them. Uh, let's see, I think I used red last time. So, there's a boundary flow line that's at the bottom that's going like this through the bottom and then exits in the uh, tow drain. The top uh, boundary flow line is more difficult to establish and there are some constructions that are available. We're not going to go through this in this class, but the, f the, the, the other thing I want to uh, mention is that if you take any point on this line here, this will be the elevation head. We're going to take the datum right here, zero, and the elevation head would be this much, and then the pressure head will be this much because this is a static body of water, so you have hydrostatic pressure here. So the total head will be this at this point, and this point is the same. The elevation head is larger than here, but the pressure head is less and the total head is the same. So what that means is that the total head on that line is the same everywhere, therefore this is an equipotential. So this is a boundary equipotential. And then this right here is a, an, uh, a boundary equipotential as well. And uh, therefore the top flow line will have to join uh, this point and this point, and it has to start perpendicular to that equipotential because that's one of the rules, and it's got to arrive in here. So, actually, 
this is not the easiest flow net to draw, but it's part of the so the anchor potential is like this. And then we have that top flow line that comes like this and then ends up perpendicular to the tow drain. And then we draw an additional two uh, lines. So we'll draw a line, uh, a flow line rather, right here, and then another one right there. Okay. And then we finish the equipotential lines. And remember, they have to be perpendicular. So if this is going to be a square, we got to start it right about here and then about here and then something like that and like this and this and that and this okay so we have to refine this uh, um, flow net but we're going to draw it like this and then use that for our calculations this is a diagram to scale and it is such that uh, this two points are identified on the uh, on the upstream phase. There's one point right here where the elevation is given as five meters, and the pressure head is identified at 12 meters. And then there's another point on that upstream face uh, which is uh, 6 meters. So this is that other point here. This is A prime. This is A. And this has a pressure head of 6 meters and an elevation head of 11 meters. Um, let's see. So in this case, what is the total number of flow channels? One, two, three. Water goes through this flow channel, this flow channel, this flow channel. Three flow channels. So NF is equal to three. What is the total number of drops? Equipotential drops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got ND equals eight. And that's going to mess me up because the book says nine. All right, so we'll have to do our own calculations, I guess, <coughs> as we go. But the, the book has a, will have a slightly different uh, solution. All right, so that's the uh, earth dam. We are going to need uh, the spillway as well because there are some of the problems are related to the spillway. I'm going to try to do the dam here, the spillway here, the cuffer dam, and the retaining wall here so that I can keep this, and then we can work on the example on the right hand side. So the spillway is like this. Oops. Spillway is vertical here. And like that. And it comes down like this. And then we have, as we saw, in the last lecture, a cutoff wall. So we have some water on this side. And we have some water on this side as well. Uh, there is an impervious layer, which is uh, about twice as deep as the cutoff wall. So we're in here right about right here and this right here is the impervious layer. Again, we start by putting down the boundary flow lines. So 
boundary flow line. We did it on the last lecture. There's one right there. All the way here. That's the top boundary flow line. And then the bottom boundary flow line goes through the bottom at the interface between the soil, uh, the pervious soil, and the impervious soil. So these are the two boundary flow lines. The boundary acre potentials is, one of them is here because this is pressure head and this is elevation head. So therefore this is an acre potential. And by the same token, here we have pressure head, elevation head. So this is the other boundary uh, acre potential line. And then the flow has to be taking place between those two boundary flow lines. So we're going to put two more, uh, one right here, and it's going to have to go back up a little bit and come back like this, and then another one here. Again, this is a right angle, okay? Uh, then I have to do the, uh, I think it's going to be a little bit too long, but that's all right. Then I have to put the uh, remaining acre potential, so square. So the first one has to start somewhere around here, and then square, something like this, then square, and square, that's not too, too good a square. So we have to adjust all this, and then this, and then uh, right here, I would have to do something like that, and then something like that, and so on. Okay. So if I had to adjust, you see that those squares are rectangles, in fact. So I would have to drop this uh, uh, flow line a little bit. It's a bit high. Um, and what else? Uh, uh, I probably would have to move this uh, flow line back this way so that uh, this would be more like a square. And that would be the part of adjusting the, uh, again, use a pencil. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a mess. Well, uh, the, the scale in here is given as uh, 10 meters. Uh, let's see, 10 meters is about the size. So right here, the scale is something about like this, where this is 10 meters. So you measure 10 meters, you go on your diagram, and you can measure to scale the distances that you need in this case. And again, we're going to take the datum right here because it's most convenient. So this is the dam, the earth dam. This is the spillway. So what's a cofferdam? 
One example is if you have to build a big bridge across a river and you have one of the piers that's in the center of the river. It's very difficult to work underwater, more expensive. So what we typically do, we do with the sheet piles, you know, we put a wall, a circular wall in the middle of the river and uh, we pump the water out, uh, you know, so seepage uh, coming into, and, and we have to pump fast enough that, you know, the water stays uh, uh, under the level of the bottom of the river in that cover dam. And then we can dry, uh, work in the dry. <clears throat> so, in this case, we have a coffer dam that looks like this. And then we'll make it that wide. And then we have the soil is right here. And then um, this goes a little bit deeper here. And then we have an impervious layer about two times the embedment. So we have an impervious layer that's right here. Let me move up that so that I can have room for the, the retaining wall below that. So we have a coffer dam that's like this. And then the soil is here, and I have an impervious layer right there. So this is impervious. Uh, this is soil. So soil goes in here. <coughs> and then we have water in the river right here water in the river right there and then the water is typically very close to the surface of the soil here and you have a pump right there that pumps the water over the sheet pile wall and throws it back into the river. So how do we do that? Well, we're on the barge and we drive this wall, we drive that wall all the way around <coughs> And then once uh, the wall is, is made, then we pump this water so that we dry it out and we keep the water level below the river bottom at, at that point. Front end. You can see that high water, low water, the water is going to flow into the coffin end. And you have people working in there. Okay? You have uh, dozers, cranes, and a number of things. So you got to be sure that uh, they, uh, and, and also you can sense that one of the problems is that the water is coming down this way and up that way. So now we're talking about upward flow against gravity. So we're going to have some issues, quick condition in here. And we need to be sure that we don't have a quick condition. Because if we have a quick condition, then this coffee dam cannot have any resistance against the push and then we lose the, uh, the coffer dam and we can hurt a lot of people. So it's critically important. All right, so flow. Uh, and you can see that there is a symmetry in here. And the symmetry is with respect to the center. So we're gonna put the axis of symmetry right there. And we're going to deal with the flow net on one side, but the other side is going to be the same. So first of all, boundary flow lines. Well, one boundary is that the water cannot go through the coffer dam. And so the one flow line, one boundary flow line is right here where that water molecule goes straight down, turns the corner hard because everybody's pushing that way, and then comes back up because everybody wants to come up for air on the other side. The other boundary flow line is the one that's at the bottom. So the water is coming this way at the bottom. And then boom, it hits the flow coming the other way, and it's got only one way, and that's to go up. Okay, so the boundary flow line is 
one boundary flow line, the other boundary line, and the entire flow is going through between those two flow lines. Boundary equipotentials. Well, we found one boundary equipotential because right here, the elevation head, so again, we're going to choose this as the datum. And you can see here that you have elevation head, and then you have no pressure head because the water is right at the atmospheric uh, level. And uh, so this is definitely uh, a boundary equipotential. On this face right here, you have elevation head plus pressure head. Here, elevation head plus pressure head. All the total heads here are the same. So this is the other boundary equipotential. Then we have to add, it says 2 to 3. Uh, 2 is usually sufficient, at least in the cases that we've had. Um, and we need to make sure we have uh, here, if we're going to put 2, you see the flow is uniform here. So I've got to divide with flow lines that are going to be equally divided, this one is going to turn a hard corner and probably come out this way, perpendicular to this one. This one is going to go below that and go way out. Whoops, I'm going to have problems at the bottom here. And it's going to have to go and come back up this way. You know, drawing formats is somewhere between engineering and art. So, okay. So these are our two intermediate flow lines, and now we're ready to put in the the, the final um, uh, equipotentials. So we need squares here. So square, square square, square, and now I've got to go like this, i got to go like that, i got to go like this, and i got to go like that. Okay? Uh, again, it would need some, some adjustment. Now, this is called the cofferdam. sense that it wouldn't do very well in that in that uh, position. And then here we have an impervious layer
where we're going to choose the data. So we're going to say again zero. Boundary flow lines. So the idea is that if it rains a lot and the water goes all over the place here, then boundary flow line, you're going to have one here, coming down, turning the corner, coming back up. And the other one is going to follow the bottom. I'll go from this side, but it goes the other way. It follows the bottom of the previous layer coming this way. The flow goes in between. Now, boundary equipotential. The water level is here, so this is an equipotential. And the water level is here, so this is an equipotential. So if you wish, I have water level here, I have water level here. So these are two boundary equipotential. Uh, additional, I'll put two of them again. And uh, maybe I'll start here, I'll come down, and then I need to turn the corner, and then come up, and then another one that will go from here, and then come down this way, and then come up like that. And then I finish with the um, necessary equipotential, so square, so I'm going to go something like that, and then something like that, something like that, and this, and that, oops, so this would have to move this way, and then maybe one like that, all right? Uh, yeah, there could be two more, maybe. Let's try it. Let's try this. I'll say so. We, we're adjusting the flow net, and so I gotta redo this, 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 and maybe there is room for three on this side to be sure that I get some squares. So square in here means something like this, and then something like that, and then something like that. Okay, that's a bit better. Number of, uh, so this is the retaining walls. Number of flow channels, one, two, three. Number of drops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the book has 11, all right. Oh, I took four uh, flow channels. Very good, so that's flow nets. Let's start doing some calculations on those uh, flow nets. First thing is, uh, the total head, the elevation head at point M on the dam. So point M is in the, is seven meters, so point M is somewhere here. Uh, five, let's say M is here, okay. So for the dam, I need to calculate the question is HT at M. So to do that, we're going to start by doing uh, the elevation head. So elevation head, you take your, you have a scale in here that says, let's see, I put a scale of 10 meters for this one. Um, I don't know, this may say 10 meters like this. So you look at what 10 meter is, you measure this, and you find that this distance here is seven meters. So H E at M, H E M, 
equal 7 meters. And then we've got to calculate HT at M. And remember, HT at M is HT at the beginning of the foment minus the number of drops to get to uh, from the beginning of the flow net to M times the drop delta HT. And then delta HT is equal to HT beginning minus HT end divided by the total number of drops. So HT beginning. This is the beginning of the flow net. This is the end of the flow net. HT beginning is HE plus HP, 17. So this is equal to 17 minus HT at the end. When I'm here, I've got some pressure head. When I'm here, I just have elevation head. This was given as 2 meters, I believe. So minus 2 divided by total number of drops, 8. So unfortunately, that's 15 over 8. And we'd have to calculate this. I didn't bring my calculator. Uh, but that would be HT. What is so HT at M? And this is part of your assignment, by the way. So you'll have to do those things. I just want to go over the principles. HTMM is HT at the beginning, 17, minus number of drops to go from the beginning to point M. So I'm going to go back here, and point M, beginning is here, one drop, 1.6 drops. Okay, I'm estimating that this from here to there is 0.6 of the entire uh, flow field length. And so I'm right here, times 1.6 times 17 minus 2 over 8. Okay, equal. And then I get HT at M in meters. So that's, uh, that would be the first result. It said HT at M, then I would get it right here. Then it says, find the pressure head at M. So if I need uh, pressure head at M, I want to do pressure head at M equals HT at M minus elevation head at M. So I know HT at M. I calculated it here and minus elevation head at M, 7 meters. So minus 7 meters equals so many meters. So that would give me HP at M. And then water stress at M, I would simply write U W at M equal HP times gamma W equals HP, whatever I have here, times 10 kilonewton per cubic meter, and that would give me U in kilopascal. Okay, and I would get U. All right. So that's the first two calculation. Flow through the dam. So let's do the flow. <coughs> so the flow through the dam is going to be Q. That's what we calculated. Uh, you know, we uh, developed that equation last time. Is K. Uh, I think it was K delta H T. So where it was? Uh, times the number of flow channels. T 
So it was, uh, all right, let me rewrite this. It was K NF over ND times HT beginning minus HT N. So K, <coughs> uh, let's see, it wasn't, uh, it's got to be given somewhere in the, pro in the problem. K was 4, uh, no, K was 10 minus 8 meters per second. So here we had K for this soil. K equals 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. So that was given. So back here, I put 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. NF was 3, right here. ND was 8, so 3 over 8 times HT beginning 17 minus HT N2. So that gives me the, uh, the flow. This is uh, meters per second uh, permeability. And this is meters. So this is in meters squared per second. And in fact, it's in meter cube per second per meter of length of the dam in this direction, perpendicular to the bore. So this gives you the, uh, the, the value of Q, whatever this. But you can see, the first thing that you might notice is that the value of Q is extremely small. 10 to the minus 8. So what is this? 15, uh, 2, 6, something like 6, 10 to the minus 8 cubic meter per second. But you'd have to multiply by the width. Of, so if the, the uh, dam was uh, 1,000 meters long, then that would be, uh, you'd have to multiply this result by 10,000, uh, by 1,000. So we said 6, 10 minus 6, 6, 10 minus 5 cubic meters, 10 minus 5 cubic meters. You're, you're looking at, uh, you know, a bucket per second. Okay. So that's why these, when you have things that are trickling downstream of the dam and you have a little spring or something, that's not a big deal. Uh, as long as it's reasonably far away from the dam, and as long as it's clear water. Again, as I said when we talked about the Teton Dam, if you start to see muddy water, then you've got to be careful. Uh, but as long as it's clear water, you know, dam soils are impervious, so something is going to go through. All right, so that's the problem for the dam. Uh, let's do, how much time do I have? All right. Uh, let's do the, um, the problem of the spillway. So for the spillway, the spillway is a concrete structure. So this, this whole thing here, that's the spillway. This whole thing is concrete. So nothing is going to go through the concrete. But one of the issues we have, whereas the dam is an earth dam, so the, the water goes through, the, one of the issues we have is that there is water pressure under the dam. And if the water pressure is higher than the weight of the concrete, then the dam floats and goes downstream. Not good. So we need to be sure that whatever pressure we have times the area under the dam, that's going to give you the force, the uplift force, and uh, you've got to check that against the weight of the dam. So how do we do that? <coughs> so this has to do with the spillway. To do that, we calculate the water pressure at uh, a number of points. So we might choose, uh, we might choose this point right here, 
as A, and this point right here as B, and this point right here as C. And we're going to calculate the water pressure at A, the water pressure at B, and the water pressure at C. How do we do that? Well, it's going to be the pressure head at A times gamma W. This is the pressure head at B times gamma W. And this is the pressure head at C times gamma W. We need the pressure head, and the way to do that is to find the total head at A minus the elevation head at A times gamma W. And the same for the others. The total head, the elevation head at A is the height above datum, and in that problem it was, I don't know, uh, let's see, maybe I have it here. Uh, it looks like 20. So elevation head was 20. Total head at A. Again, we've got to apply the rule that we have there. Total head at A is total head at the beginning of the throw net minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.2 times delta HT. So I'm going to write it here. <coughs> total head at the beginning. I think it says, uh, let's see, I had here, mm, where am I, right here, 20 plus 16 it looks like, looks like this is 20 meters and this is 16 meters. So total head at the beginning of the flow net was 36, so it's uh, uh, HT beginning minus ND delta HT, that's HT at A minus, we say 20, times 10. And then HT beginning was 36 minus, what did I say, number of drops, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.2. Minus 6.2 times the drop of total head per flow field. Total head here is 36. Total head at the other end is uh, uh, 20. It looks like there's hardly any water, so minus 0. So 36, well, it looks like, in my case, I put a little bit of water. So we'll say 2 meters, let's say. So 36 minus 2 uh, divided by divided by the total number of drops. So that is divided by, uh, what did we have? 12 divided by 12. Okay. So I've got HT beginning minus little nd 6.2 delta HT, HT beginning minus HTN divided by number of drops minus 20 and then times 10. And that gives me the pressure, the water pressure at A. I repeat this for B, I repeat this for C, and then I can do a diagram of the spillway like that. And I have a pressure, a water pressure at A, which is right here, of U, W at A. And then I have pressure at B, that's UW. It's going to be smaller because the water is flowing, losing energy, and I've got a low water level here. 
and then the water pressure at C, which is going to be even smaller. So what I do then is I do a diagram of pressure. I calculate the area under this diagram. And that area is equal to the uplift force. So it's going to be uh, UW times this area, <clears throat> and then this trapezoidal shape, this trapezoidal shape, this rectangular shape. I mean, obviously, these are estimates. You could say, well, maybe it's going this way. And it gives you, but so it, it gives you an estimate. You would have to calculate the water pressure everywhere under the dam, see if you wanted to do a very accurate uh, calculation. And then you would have to compare this uplift force. Now the uplift force will be in. <coughs> so you're measuring, you're multiplying U W times a length. So it's going to be kilopascal kilonewton per square, per square meter times meter. So the uplift force is going to be in kilonewton per meter. Why per meter? Because it's per meter of length perpendicular to the board. And then you would have to calculate you know, how much the weight of the, uh, of the dam, of the spillway is so that you could uh, resolve what type of factor of safety you have between W and the uplift force. All right, time for one more. Let's do the, uh, the cofferdam. So for the cofferdam, one of the issues we're facing is this uplift, uh, this upward flow rather, and we need to check the exit gradient. Let's do that. So this is cofferdam. And we're going to have to calculate I exit. By definition, I exit is the hydraulic gradient in the smallest flow field on the exit phase. So if you look at the exit phase, Flow is going this way, it's exiting here, where it's being pumped back into the river. But the smallest flow field in the exit phase is very likely this one. Okay? So this is the smallest flow field on the exit phase. We need to calculate the hydraulic gradient in there. So hydraulic gradient, loss of total head across that flow field, divided by the length of that flow field. Loss of total head, well, it's HT beginning minus HTN divided by the total number of drops divided by the length of the flow field. So I don't know, uh, let me see. Uh, length of the flow field, uh, five meters, let's take two meters. So this is going to be 2 meters, and uh, HT beginning, I'm going to estimate, okay? I would say HT beginning 15 minus HTN, 0, because when we come at the end right there, oh, sorry, HT beginning is 15, in other words, this distance here. I estimate it to be 15 meters. The HT end is this distance right there. So if that's uh, 15, that's going to be about half of that. So this is going to be 7.5 meters. So 15 minus 7.5, that's the total loss of head. Number of drops, 9 divided by 9. Uh, and then divided by two. So how much is that? Uh, that's seven and a half, seven and a half divided by 18. So it's maybe 0.4 or, so, or something. I, I don't, 
you can calculate that. So I exit is about 0.4. What is I critical? Remember this is the quicksand condition. We say I critical is gamma saturated minus gamma W divided by gamma W. And gamma saturated would have to be measured or given in here. Let's say that gamma saturated is equal to 20 kilonewton per cubic meter. So that would be 20 minus 10 divided by 10. So this is going to be 1. And you can see that the factor of safety against the quick condition is going to be 1 divided by 0.4. 2.5. And that's a little bit tight. So we, we, uh, we would need to do something. One of the things that uh, can be done to uh, solve that problem is to take the cofferdam all the way to the impervious layer. And then you, you're blocking. So one way is to say, all right, we're not going to let the water go through. And we're going to put a wall that's blocking the flow completely. And that way, we won't have to worry about uh, this uplift uh, condition, and that's that's a, a good solution, but obviously more expensive, uh, and, and so that's an economical decision versus the risk to be taken. There are other problems; you'll see them in your assignment. But this gives you an idea of some of the calculations that we do with flow nets, and that concludes our series on flow over the soil. Next time we will start shear strengths. So I'll see you then.